If you would like to hear Night Dreams Talk Radio on your local radio station, let them know. Tell them to check out www.nightdreamstalkradio.com and thank you. Do you have a paranormal story you want to share on Night Dreams Talk Radio? You could be a guest. Email us at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail.com. You can advertise your business on Night Dreams Talk Radio and you will be heard worldwide. Why not contact us at nightdreamstalkradio at gmail.com. You're listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio After Dark with our host, Gary Anderson. And here I am. I'm talking to Dr. Barry E. Taft tonight. We're talking about, well, ghosts and all that type of things, and even gray, possibly. We'll find out more. Doctor, I got a couple questions I want to ask you. Sure. Okay, now this is regarding my one son. That, you know, since he's now 26 years old, since uh, the last 11 years, he's on anti-seizure medicine. When he's not, he goes off of it on his own because he thinks, hey, you know, I'll, I'll feel better. And he goes off of it. And then he he gets, you know, the seizures, like mad. Right. And then he's in the hospital. And it's got to the point, like, twice a month for years. The, the, the problem is, I just recently, because he has other issues, we had to have him removed from the house. Now, when he was living here, a lot of strange things were going on. We'd hear banging on the walls. We'd hear thumping. We'd Just a lot of strange things. Uh, as soon as he was, you know, removed from the house... It all stopped. Of course, the, the mechanism. Uh, he is the pol- he was the poltergeist agent. Without his presence, it won't happen. However, let me say this: that we've had Kate. Well, I should say, were you living there before your son was born? Is uh, that the house you're living in? He yeah, no. We we've owned the house for twenty years old. He's twenty six. Okay. But what I'm saying, were you living in that house before he was born? No. You and your wife? No. Okay. Yeah. If you, what you're saying is right. We see, keep seeing these patterns over and over again and the links to people who are seizure-prone and epileptic. And it's, it, it's so common now that if, they, if this doesn't pop up during the, an investigation, we're shocked. A lot of times, people, you know, they, they were they think seizure for every grand mal convulsions, and they don't realize it can be real minor things. Certain muscle groups will spasm, and the whole bit. Um, it, it's like I said, we know enough now. We could instrument this. We could bring people in that have these conditions and happen to be poltergeist run functional MRIs, run PET scans and spec scans, and the whole, the whole nine yards. We get information that would be extraordinary, except the doctors involved would never work again because they'd be looked at as lunatics, that getting involved with the paranormal and modern medical society or technical society is a no-no. So we could do it. There are all this technology. We might learn a lot. But in the end, I don't think what we'd like, I don't think we'd like what we learned. And uh, it all, basically, it seems to work like this. Okay. Um, if any, most people, if they travel all over the world, and went to thousands of different haunted locations, some infamous, some minor, whatever, everything in between, most people will go, they'll read something, then they're there, and they'll talk to people, and they'll move on. Nothing will happen. Every so often, the right person will come by at the right time, in the right place, and voila, like plugging in the DVD player and turning it on. And this is interesting. It's something that we would call inductive resonance coupling. So that means if the individual who's having this phenomena, their nervous system couples to the energy in the environment through their biomagnetic field, things occur. And this is where it gets even stranger. Measuring bioelectric fields is really easy because they're pretty strong. 
Measuring biomagnetic fields is extremely difficult because they're extremely weak, three orders of magnitude weaker. Um, you need superconducting sensors, which I, don't, which I believe are not portable yet. They may be, but not yet. Um, and however, if you put in one of the many instruments that I use to research cases near the average person, you will not get a reading because instruments can't record energy that subtle. If you put those instruments near a poltergeist agent, wham, you get bursts of energy coming from them in the, in the magnetic spectrum because their bodies are putting out thousands of times, maybe millions of times, the normal energy of an average individual. So, okay, so we have all these variables. Could we then artificially trigger the phenomena? What I mean, what I mean by this, we know in neuro neurology, if you put a strobe light in front of someone's closed eyes, you drive the brain waves, and you see, get to see certain things going on in the, mind, in the brain by measuring this. There may be a way to do the same thing with this phenomena, but instead of using light, we should use a pulsed magnetic field, adjust the variable. There's a pulse duration, pulse interval, pulse repetition rate. And if you got it tuned right, you could trigger the events occurring in the environment. However, you're more likely to electrocute the people before <laughs> you get good data coming out of the situation. So it's very unlikely to happen. Interesting. Now, I, the other part of the question I got to ask you, when he yeah. was living in the house, I would have like out of body experiences when I go to sleep, weird dreams. And, mm -hmm. and as soon as he was out of the house, it was like I told my wife it was over with all the strange dreams, the out of body experiences and, and seeing things was gone. And that's when my wife said that she has never admitted any of this to me ever. Mm -hmm. She said I was having really strange dreams and as soon as he was gone yeah. they all stopped yeah it, it's i mean your bodies were i mean he is your son so there are certain elements that both of you have in common with unfortunately not the epilepsy i hope but there's enough of a commonality that your ne nervous system's linked to his and his energy was driving or it was driving your energy to extremes interesting and yeah it, it's it's amazing, and, and the more we learn about this, the stranger it gets. So strange. Now, imagine, if you would, a six-foot-two guy weighing 195 pounds, picked up and thrown against the wall like a rag doll. Now, by all the energies we know of in the universe, and there's, there's uh, electromagnetism, there's, there's strong nuclear, there's weak nuclear, and there's gravity. By what we know about these, long before a human could be picked up and thrown on the wall across the room by an invisible force, the energy generated by such an element of work would produce an extreme amount of heat that would make your clothing and everything in the room burst into flame. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Force equals mass times acceleration. Well, something's accelerating a person what is it? Uh, not only does it not get hot in the environment, it often feels cold, although it may not be cold. It could be a reaction to a strong magnetic field again. It, it, so basically, we're looking at what's called an endothermic form of energy, meaning there's two types. There's exothermic, where energy is emitted by things, which is what we know of. Endothermic is where energy is drawn inward or not energy at all coming out. And this seems to be endothermic. There is no, as far as I know, there's no endothermic energy in our world that can do substantial work, like the type I'm describing here, like a person being thrown across the room. And so when you start encountering, encountering these extraordinary events in the field, and you're watching it with all your education, you go, what? How can, well, does it make any sense? That's why it's called paranormal. But I got a funny feeling that when we learn what this is, it would change the future of humanity. It would probably give us new medicine. It would very likely give us new propulsion systems, 
new ways to generate power to run the world without heat, things would change in a really positive manner. And this is part of why I'm doing this is, what are we going to learn? What are we from all this? Where will it take us down the road? Because I thought, you know, we went in to ghosts and entities and blah, 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 blah. And this brings me, before we jump to the more sub, sub, subdued phenomena, let's talk about some great cases. Um, one is the entity case. I hate talking about it because people have been talked to death. Bottom line, 1974. My colleague at the time and one of his friends is in Hunter Books in Westwood, like depicted in the movie from Fox in 1983. So he's talking to him about our research, and a woman in the next aisle by the name of Doris Bither says, oh, my house is haunted. So he took her name and got her phone number, and we went out to her house a few days later. Hot August night, 1974. Neil Diamond was not there. <laughs> but... <laughs> um, go to go to her little bungalow on Braddock Drive in Culver City, and um, it stunk. There was a terrible odor in there, like decomposing organic matter, which we've had before occasionally in cases. And what's stranger is that the first that we sit down, the first thing she says to us right off the bat is, "I'm asking a lot of questions." And she's very evasive, which is not that uncommon, and. She said, oh, I've been, the, the, the ghosts are raping me. I went, what? Huh? My colleague and I actually rolled our eyes back. Oh, this woman's psychotic. <laughs> she needs to see a psychiatrist. And, you know, so we, we pretty much told her there's not much we can do because, you know, this is not part of her work. Here's the name of some people to call you, CLA. And I don't know if she ever did so, but I don't think she did. About 10 days later, she called. Some neighbors had witnessed some stuff. So we come back to the house, and it's still real warm out and muggy, and uh, we're, we're going to the bedroom, and it feels like it's refrigerated, and there was no air conditioning in the house. We're in the kitchen talking to her, and a cu- lower cupboard door flies open, and a frying pan come, skillet comes flying out across the kitchen. No animals, no wires, no children, no springs, so... So the case evolved to the point where we were seeing these strange, what I call corpuscular masses of light, like old lava lamps. And they were always lime green in color, and don't ask me why. Uh, we saw this, and so the problem is we got one picture. It looks like a comet with a tail on it. It's on my website, and it's in my book. And my website is barrytaft.net, so if you can find, we can find this there. And my book is Aliens Above, Ghosts Below. So she's telling, you know, we're there, and lights are spit. We take pictures, but we couldn't tell where they were coming from or going to. There was no reference, nor could we tell their speed. So we turned her bedroom into, like, a laboratory. The walls were covered with black poster boards with duct tape. We had grids. Every panel would have a number and a magnetic orientation on it. And it got to the point... One night, um, we got a call from Doris at like 2 in the morning. We were running out there, and something had torn down all the poster boards and the plaster and the paint. And she, was, she could have done it on a tall ladder, but it's unlikely for the way she was reacting. We put them back up, we go back the next couple of days, and uh, we're, the whole thing, these lights, these weird lights which we seal the house off now from all external lighting. So there's no way that we're going to have a light coming in from the outside. And uh, the bedroom felt very cold when it shouldn't have. And lights coalesce in one corner and where, where Doris is sitting on her bed. And they, they form the upper torso of a very large man, well over six feet, closer to seven. Very muscular. You could see the, the, the brow ridge. You could see the jaw and the, uh, the pectorals and the whole bit and the... And then it was articulating, it was moving. It was very, it seemed to be aware of the fact we were there. And then it just turned out like a light going off. So light came on, everybody was.